Hello, this is Neil Polhemus. I'm CTO of StatPoint Technologies and the Director of Development of StatGraphics Software. I'm going to spend the next 45 minutes or so introducing you to our latest version, StatGraphics Centurion version 17. StatGraphics Centurion 17 is the 17th version of StatPoint's statistical analysis and data visualization program for Windows. It contains more than 230 statistical procedures. StatGraphics Centurion is designed for practitioners who want a powerful yet easy to use tool for analyzing their data. Some of the new important features in version 17 include 32 new statistical procedures. There are also enhancements to 20 existing procedures. We've increased the data capacity by rewriting some of the algorithms. And we've added important new interface features, such as document passwords, an audit trail, improved graphics editing, zoom and pan, and the ability to record videos of your dynamic graphs. I've divided my talk today into three main areas. The first area is data visualization. I'll be showing you procedures for visualizing univariate data, bivariate data, and multivariate data. I'll also demonstrate some of the exciting new dynamic statlets that we've added in version 17. The second section will deal with statistical modeling. I'll show you applications of stack graphics for fitting distributions, for forecasting time series data, and for Krieging as applied to geospatial data. Finally, the third section will show you the new features in design of experiments, including computer-generated optimal designs and the response surface explorer. You're looking at the main window of Stack Graphics Centurion version 17. Along the top is the main menu that gives you access to the 230 statistical procedures. Below that is a main toolbar with shortcuts to commonly used procedures, and below that an analysis toolbar which becomes active once you've done a statistical analysis. I'm now going to load some data into the Stack Graphics data sheet. It's in an Excel file, so I'll go to the top menu and select File. Open, Open Data Source. To Stack Graphics, an Excel file is an external data file, so I'll set that radio button and press OK. Actually, we can import data from various programs, including Access and Excel and MATLAB and SAS and SPSS. In this case, it's in an Excel file, so I'll set the file type to Excel and press Browse. The name of the Excel data file is World Bank. It contains a two-row header at the top of the spreadsheet with names for each of the columns and also comments. When I press OK, the data will be loaded into the Stack Graphics data sheet. You'll see in the data sheet Statistics for 188 countries for each year between 1961 and 2010. You'll see statistics such as the population, the population density, the percent of the population that lives in rural areas, the age dependency ratio, life expectancies, fertility rates, GDP, real interest rates, and other interesting statistics. To demonstrate for you some of the new data visualization procedures added to Stack Graphics version 17, I'm going to select an interesting column from the World Bank data file. The column labeled Life Expectancy Total is the expected years at birth for everyone living in a particular country in a particular year. On the top menu, there's an item labeled Statlets. Statlets are dynamic graphs that allow you to interactively visualize your data. I'll pick Interactive Histogram 
and tell it I want to look at total life expectancy, in which case it will display for me a frequency histogram. By default, the frequency histogram has 40 classes, but I can use the controls on the Statlet toolbar to increase or decrease that. In this case, I'm going to increase it to 50. There are checkboxes on the Statlet toolbar that allow me to add other features to the graph. I might start by checking Add Normal Curve, in which case it'll put a normal distribution on the plot a normal density function with the same mean and standard deviation as the data. You can see that uh, in this case the normal distribution doesn't do a very good job. Another approach would be to use a non-parametric density estimate which passes a window along the x-axis with a particular width. As I adjust the width I'll pick up more or less detail about the shape of the distribution. In this case, if you bring the width down to about 15, you'll see that it picks up most of the smooth features of the histogram. You'll see a well-defined peak in the data at about 70 years, and possibly a secondary mode down around 50 years. To visualize the joint distribution of two variables, I'll go to the top menu and select Statlets, Bivariate Density. The first variable is Life Expectancy. The second variable I'll look at will be the Fertility Rate. The Fertility Rate is the average number of children per woman. When I press OK, you'll see a three-dimensional histogram, and there's quite a bit of correlation between these two variables. You'll see the pattern of negative correlation between life expectancy and fertility rate. Where the fertility rates are high, the life expectancy tends to be low. If I want to restrict the analysis to 1961, I can go back to the data input dialog box and in the select field type year equals 1961. That was the first year that's available in the World Bank data file. And you'll see in that case that there were more low life expectancy values uh, than in the overall plot. I can push the radio button corresponding to the normal distribution and it will fit a bivariate normal distribution to the data. You see that it has a single well-defined peak. I can also ask for a non-parametric density estimator. And if I reduce the width of the density estimator a little bit, you'll see that in 1961 the data were definitely somewhat bimodal. Checking the display in 2D button shows the two modes fairly well. If I go back and ask for the year 2009 instead of 1961, you'll see that the distribution is now fairly unimodal. Everyone has moved toward longer life expectancies, lower fertility rates. I'm now going to look at a couple ways to visualize multivariate data. The first will be through the correlation matrix. To calculate a correlation matrix, I'll go to Describe, Numeric Data, Multiple Variable Analysis. I'll pick 10 variables that I'm interested in. The population density, the rural population, the female percentage, the age dependency ratio, the life expectancy. I'll also look at the difference between female and male life expectancy, fertility rate, infant mortality rate, trade, and GDP per capita. When I press OK, I'll be asked how I want to handle missing data. I'll tell it to take all data wherever possible when it computes the correlations between pairs of variables. 
when I press OK, I now get to select what I'd like to see. What I'm particularly interested in seeing is the correlation plot. Here is the correlation plot, and it shows on each cell of the matrix the correlation between a particular pair of variables. I'll reduce the text size a little bit so that things fit better. Correlations are color-coded from dark blue for a strong negative correlation to dark red for a strong positive correlation. At the moment the variables are listed in the order that I specified them. To make it more ordered I can press the right mouse button and go to pane options and ask to order the variables by the first eigenvector or their location with respect to the first principal component. That will tend to put similar variables close together. You can see in this case some fairly strong positive correlations down in the bottom right corner between the age dependency ratio, the infant mortality rate, and the fertility rate. You also see some fairly strong negative correlations between life expectancy, fertility, and infant mortality. There's a lot to be learned if you look at the patterns in this particular core gram. I can also push the right mouse button, go to pane options, and ask it to display an X if a correlation is not significant at the 5% level. And you can see that, in fact, some of the pairwise correlations, particularly with respect to female percentage, are not statistically significant. What's missing in the displays we've looked at up until now is the ability to see how things have changed over time. Under the Statlets menu, there are several visualizers. The 1D dynamic visualizer, the 2D visualizer, the 3D visualizer, and so forth, which are very useful for displaying multiple time series. For example, let's take the 2D dynamic visualizer. Along the y-axis, let's put the total life expectancy. Along the x-axis, we'll put the fertility rate. We'll slice the data by year. And you'll see when we get into the statlet that the slicer is something that we'll be able to dynamically change. Country code identifies the points. And I'm going to color the points by their region in the world. When I press OK, a bubble chart will appear, showing initially the data for the year 1961. There are several interesting things you see in this particular plot. First, you can see the strong negative correlation between life expectancy and fertility rate. Countries with high fertility rates tended to have lower life expectancies than those with low fertility rates. You also see quite significant differences between different parts of the world. By and large, the European countries all had high life expectancies and low fertility rates, whereas most of Africa had much lower life expectancies and higher fertility rates. Now, let's let time evolve. This slider on the Statlet toolbar will change the year at which the data are displayed. And you can see, as I increase the year, a general movement of countries up toward the upper left corner of the plot. I can also push the right arrow on the Statlet toolbar, and the year will move one year at a time. And you can see most of the world moving up to that upper left-hand corner. If I'd like to follow individual countries, I can label them. Let's move back to 1961. And I'll press the right mouse button and go to Analysis Options. One interesting country to look at is Mexico. 
And in order to follow Mexico, I'm going to ask to label the selected identifiers and also to leave breadcrumbs behind. Breadcrumbs will show how a country has moved. And if you can see the label, it's right about here. That orange country is Mexico. Now let's let time evolve and you'll see Mexico start to move with the rest of the world and you can see the breadcrumbs left behind that lets you see the path that Mexico has followed. Version 17 of Stackgraphic Centurion also improves its ability to create demographic maps. Stackgraphics can now plot any area defined by a BNA boundary file. There are three procedures for creating demographic maps. The first is a static map with gradient fills. The second is a static map where brushing is performed on the different regions to illustrate the distribution of a particular variable. And finally, there's also a dynamic map which displays changes over time. This file contains some data that would be usefully displayed on a demographic map. For example, the column called unemployment shows the unemployment rate in each department in France during the third quarter of 2012. To plot this data, I'll go to plot demographic map. The column containing the data is unemployment. Dep code will allow me to match the rows of my data file with the regions on my map. Where it says boundary file, I can push browse and find a file that defines each department in France as a polygon. When I press OK, the map will then be created. I can move it around, resize it a little bit to get the aspect ratio the way I want. On this map, the unemployment rate is shown via a color that ranges from dark blue for an unemployment rate of 5.5 to dark red for an unemployment rate of 15.5. You can see back when this data was collected, there was quite a bit of variability amongst the different departments in France. Another interesting thing we can do with this data is to brush the map. To brush the map, I can select Statlets, Demographic Map Brushing. I'll make the same data entries as I made before. This time, though, when the map of France is created, each department will be colored either red or blue. Departments with an unemployment rate less than or equal to 11% will be shown in blue. Those departments with an unemployment rate greater than 11 will be shown as red. You can use the slider on the Statlet toolbar to change the cutoff between red and blue. If I bring the cutoff down enough, I can see those departments that have the lowest unemployment rates. If I bring the slider up, it's easy to see the departments with the highest unemployment rates. If I have demographic data over multiple years, there's a third procedure called the Demographic Map Visualizer that will let me see how things have changed over time. Here's a plot of all the countries in the Western Hemisphere showing by color the percentage of the population that lives in rural areas. You'll see in 1961 quite a bit of red and orange, particularly in some of the Central America and South American countries. If I push the right mouse button, I can let time evolve, and you'll notice most of the countries getting bluer and the dark reds and oranges disappearing as the rural populations become smaller and smaller in most of the countries.
The second section of my talk will cover statistical modeling. Stack Graphics has a very wide range of procedures available for different types of model building. There are procedures for fitting distributions, for doing regression analysis, there are analysis of variance procedures, there are methods for handling life data, for forecasting time series, for analyzing multivariate methods. There are also procedures to determine adequate sample sizes, a wide range of procedures for statistical process control, and a new procedure for Krieging as applied to geospatial data. I've loaded into the Stack Graphics data sheet measurements made of the resistivity of 100 electronic components. I'm interested in knowing what the probability is that the resistivity of a component might be greater than 500. In that case it would be unacceptable. I'm going to take this data, fit a distribution to it, and estimate that probability. To begin, I'll go to Statlets and call up the interactive histogram again. I'll tell it I'd like to see a histogram for resistivity. And it's fairly clear when you look at it that this particular distribution is not normal. I can try adding a normal curve to it. But I think you can see, particularly if you add the nonparametric density to it, that the distribution is somewhat skewed to the right. To estimate the probability that the resistivity of an electronic component would be greater than 500, I can't therefore assume that it follows a normal distribution. There are two approaches possible to handle that non-normality. First, I might be able to find a transformation of resistivity which made the distribution fairly normal after the data were transformed. A second possible approach would be to find another distribution, fit that to the data, and estimate the probability of exceeding 500. To apply the first approach, I can select Statlets from the top menu and choose Power Transformations. When I give it the data, it will begin by plotting a quantile-quantile plot for the data. On the y-axis, you see the empirical quantiles, the observed quantiles for resistivity. And on the x-axis, the equivalent quantiles, assuming the data came from a normal distribution. If the normal distribution fit well, these points should follow the diagonal line, which they clearly don't. There is a slider on the toolbar that lets me try, however, raising the data to different powers. As I change it, I could increase the power above one or below one. And I think you can see as I reduce the power below one, the points fall closer and closer to a straight line. In fact, if I push the Optimize button, it will tell me using the methods of Box and Cox that if I took the data and raised it to the minus 0.4 power, I'd get points quite close to the line. The plot also shows the results of running a Shapiro-Wilk test on the transformed data. The p-value, if you use a power of minus 0.4, is well above 0.05. So it would probably be safe to assume that the data, when transformed by that power, were approximately normally distributed. If I wanted instead to try fitting a different distribution, I could go to the top menu to describe Distribution Fitting, Fitting Uncensored Data. Putting in resistivity, it will ask me which of 45 different probability distributions I'd like to fit. Well, I'll start with the normal, even though I know that's not appropriate, 
and press OK. When it shows a list of tables and graphs, I'll be sure to check the table for comparison of alternative distributions. Then when I press OK, it will create for me, amongst other output, a table showing different distributions and how well they fit from best fitting to worst fitting. The best fitting distribution in this particular case is the largest extreme value distribution. I can then go over to the histogram and superimpose on the histogram a largest extreme value distribution in addition to the normal distribution. And I think you can see that the largest extreme value distribution does a good job in picking up the skewness of that data. Let's now make use of what we've learned to determine the probability that an electronic component would have a resistivity greater than 500. I'll go to the Statlets menu and this time select Process Capability Analysis. Process Capability Analysis is used to determine whether the majority of a product that I'm producing is within specification limits. I'll select Resistivity and enter in the field for upper specification limit the value 500. When I press OK, the Statlet window will open up. There are a number of things to notice in this window. First off, you'll see that by default, a normal distribution has been fit to the data. We'll fix that in just a moment. Secondly, you see limits on either side of the mean of the normal distribution at plus and minus three standard deviations. You see a line at the specification of 500. And near the bottom of the list of statistics on the right of the graph, you see a number labeled DPM, which stands for defects per million. I estimate, if I believe this normal distribution, that on average 117 electronic components per million will be above the specification limit of 500. Now let's go make some changes. First off, since we only have an upper specification limit, I'll switch the bounds from two-sided to upper. Secondly, instead of plotting the limit at plus and minus three sigma, I'll ask for tolerance limits. Tolerance limits bound with a specified level of confidence a specified proportion of the population. Initially, it will produce 95, 90 tolerance limits. I'm going to increase the percentage of the population that I'm bounding and bring it up to 99.9. I can now state with 95% confidence that at least 99.9% .9 of the electronic component components are less than 490. At least that's the case if I believe that they follow a normal distribution. To select a more appropriate model for the data, I'll go up to the Statlet toolbar and grab the slider for the power. I'm going to bring the power down to the value we know is good for this particular data, which is minus 0 0.4. At that point, the upper tolerance bound is 799, well above the specification limit of 500. In addition, the estimated defects per million is almost 7200. Our other choice is to leave the power at 1 bring it back to one here and then instead of using a normal distribution tell it we'd like to use the largest extreme value distribution. For the largest extreme value distribution the upper tolerance bound is 628 the defects per million just over 4000. StatGraphics version 17 also contains a statlet 
that applies exponential smoothing to time series. Here you see the monthly unemployment rates in the United States between January 2001 and September 2014. The sliders on the toolbar will let you change the smoothing parameters, in this case the alpha and beta values in the Holtz linear exponential smoothing. As I change the smoothing parameters, you can see the error statistics change. And if I push the Optimize button, it will find the optimal values of alpha and beta. The forecasts suggest that unemployment will continue to fall over the next 12 months, but the 95% forecast limits show that this is far from certain. The second example of statistical modeling I'd like to show you is Krieging. Krieging is used in geostatistics to predict the value of a random variable over a spatial region. Given measurement in a set of locations in that region, Krieging creates a map of the predicted value throughout the region. It's widely used in environmental science, in mining, in soil science, in hydrogeology, and in many other areas. The example we're going to look at is a well-known data set collected at Broom's Barn at the Rothamsted Agricultural Research Center in Rothamsted, England. Soil samples were obtained at 435 locations throughout a 77 hectare field. They measured the exchangeable potassium, the pH, and the available phosphorus in each sample. I've loaded the soil sample data into the Stat Graphics data sheet. I'll now go to the top menu and select Statlitz Krieging. The data that I'll analyze is the log of the potassium measurements. The X1 and X2 fields locate each soil sample with respect to an origin at the bottom left corner of the Brooms Barn field. The X1 and X2 boundary columns define the region over which the data were collected. When the statlet opens up, the first thing you'll see is a three-dimensional scatter plot. The location of each point in the vertical direction represents the measured log potassium. Step one in applying Krieging is to model the spatial dependence between points separated by a given distance. That's done by estimating the variogram. The variogram shows the estimated variance of the difference between points located at a particular lag distance. It typically begins at a positive value located at a distance of zero. That's called the nugget. Increases and then asymptotically reaches a level value called the sill. By changing the maximum lag at which I estimate the spatial dependence, I can come up with a good statistical model for that spatial dependence. There are a variety of models that can be used to represent the variogram. The exponential model seems to do a reasonable job in this case. Once I'm happy with my model, I can ask to see the response plot. This shows a contour plot where the color represents the estimated value of log potassium. If I want a little more detail, I can change the increment at which the contour values are plotted. I can also display the estimated log potassium has a perspective diagram in three dimensions. You can very clearly see that there's one hot spot in the field and a couple low valleys. One more plot to show you here and that's the variance map. The variance map shows the estimated prediction variance for our predictions of log potassium. Where we had complete data, you'll see that the variance was quite low. But at the edges of the field, 
and at those locations where there was missing data, the variance is considerably higher. The last topic we'll talk about today is a new addition to the Stack Graphics Design of Experiments wizard. It's the generation by the program of optimal designs. With computer-generated optimal designs, the analyst specifies the factors to be varied, the model to be fit, and the number of runs that can be performed. The program then generates an optimal set of experimental runs. These designs are especially useful when it's important to keep the total number of experimental runs as small as possible, when there are constraints on the combination of factors at which experiments can be performed, or when the analyst wants to fix a poorly designed experiment. The example we're going to look at is from a book titled Optimal Design of Experiments, a Case Study Approach by Peter Goose and Bradley Jones. In a sealing process, the experimenters wanted to achieve a peel strength of 4.5 pounds. There were four experimental factors that they could vary, temperature, pressure, speed, and supplier. They could afford to do 24 runs, and since there were three suppliers, that amounted to eight experimental runs for each supplier. To generate a design for this experiment, I'd go to DOE on the top menu and select Experimental Design Wizard. That would open up a window with a special Design of Experiments Wizard toolbar. It consists of 12 buttons that take you through the process of creating an experiment, evaluating the design, analyzing the data, and optimizing the response. Step one of the process defines the responses. In this case, there's a single response, peel strength. I wish to analyze the mean, and the goal of the experiment is to hit a target value of 4.5. Acceptable values of peel strength are between 3 and 6, but the optimal target is 4.5. The second step defines the experimental factors. In this case, there are three continuous factors, temperature, pressure, and speed, and I've defined the ranges over which each of those factors can be varied. The fourth supplier is categorical, and there are three levels of supplier 1, 2, and 3. Step 3 of the Experimental Design Wizard is used to select the type of design I wish to run. When I press Step 3, I can select up to three design components, one for process factors, one for mixture components, and one for noise factors if there were any. In this case, I only need to push the Options button for the process factors and can then choose between a multi-level factorial design and a computer-generated design. I'll take the computer-generated design one more step, if I had constraints on the experimental region, linear combinations of factors that constrained the combinations that I could run, I could specify those linear constraints on this dialog box. In that case, no runs would be generated that violated those constraints. There are no constraints in this example, so I'll just set, accept the computer-generated designs. S step 4 is where I specify the model that I'd like to fit. By default, it's been set to a quadratic model, which involves the main effects of all the factors, quadratic effects of the quantitative or continuous factors, and two-factor interactions. If I wanted, I could double-click on an effect to remove it from the model, or double-click again to put it back. In this case, I'll accept the full quadratic model. To actually generate the runs to be performed, I'll now press Step 5. 
At this step, I may choose between I-optimal, D-optimal, A-optimal, or G-optimal designs. I-optimal designs minimize the average prediction variance. Over here, I specify the number of runs I wish to perform. I'll ask for 24 base runs. That's 24 different combinations of the factors. I can also ask for a certain number of replicates or a certain number of center points to be added to my base runs. Before I push the Create button, I'll push the Advanced button. What's most critical here is the setting for the number of continuous factor levels to consider. I'm going to reset that to 3, meaning it will only consider runs involving high, low, or medium values of each continuous factor. I'll push OK and then Create and it will generate 24 runs that make an I optimal design. When I push OK, those runs are placed into the Stack Graphics data sheet and a column is created for me to put in the response values after I run those experiments. Once the experimental runs have been performed, I can return to the experimental design wizard and analyze the results. Here's the data from Goose and Jones' book with the observed peel strength for their 24 experimental runs. Going back to the experimental design window, I'll push step 8, analyze design, and ask for that quadratic model to be fit to peel strength. You can see from my Pareto chart that the only statistically significant factor is the supplier. Speed and pressure also seem to make a contribution, although they were not statistically significant. To look at the main effects plot, you can maximize this pane, and you'll see that supplier 3 gives a lower peel strength than the other suppliers, while supplier 2 has the highest peel strength. It's also informative to generate a surface plot. Here's a contoured surface showing the effect on peel strength of changes in pressure and speed at a particular value of temperature for supplier number 1. You'll see in this case that the highest peel strength is achieved at low pressures and high speeds. If you push the Explore button on the Analysis toolbar, you'll get a dialog box that allows you to change levels of the factors. It's easy, therefore, to see what the difference would be if you used Supplier 2 or Supplier 3 and you can see a fairly strong interaction, particularly when I select Supplier 3. You can also use this slider here to change the value of temperature, although temperature doesn't seem to have much effect on the fitted statistical model. Many thanks to Dr. Christian Charles for arranging this talk. You can find out more about Stat Graphics at the Sigma Plus website, www.statgraphics.fr. You'll also find information about Stat Graphics version 17 at StatPoint's website, which is www.statgraphics17.com.